Welcome to another Home Energy Minute, part of our collaboration with Home Energy Magazine. On our journey around the world, we are going to go to New Zealand today to talk to Adam Cohen, who I met when he was on my podcast, the Building Performance Podcast, a number of years ago. He is an architect and a builder. His company used to be Structures Design Build, but now he's got his fingers in a lot of different places. He's mostly training and advocating for making buildings smarter, better, having our interaction with them be healthier. So let's go ahead and hear what he has to say. Great to talk with you. Thank you very much for getting us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure, Abby. Just say, first of all, that you're not just an advocate for high performance building. You know what is possible because you yourself designed and built lots and lots of high performance buildings. And you, know, yeah. that, you know how hard it is. So people can find out more about who you are, what you think at your YouTube channel, which is called Passive House. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yep, yep, they can do that. Passive House has been a thing that you've been working on specifically. There, you know, among all of the building certifications, in case viewers don't know, Passive House tends to be the most hardcore performance-based building standard. So, um, so when you have a country like New Zealand, where you've got things like importing building materials, they don't they probably don't have a lot of stuff that they're manufacturing there within the country, aside from wood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you've got traditional building methods. Is high performance building even a thing that we should be doing? Or is it kind of too elitist? Or how? Well, we no, it's not. No, so there's, all, you know, just like, like every person, you know, uh, Every country has got its own idiosyncrasies, right? So, so the New Zealand ecosystem around the constructed environment is really interesting. It's very different from the United States and Canada. Um, it's a small country at the edge of the world. Um, over the years, the um, building products that have, that are and they do make. I mean, they they you can they they grow a lot of they grow a lot of pine. They they do make gypsum. They do make insulation. But the problem is. Most of their building, major building products are uh, monopolies. A few of them are duopolies. So New Zealand's building material it, uh, prices are incredibly high, you know, like two and three times what we pay uh, in the West if you do the conversion. And even more than they pay in Australia, right? I mean, it's it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, you know, the old crisis opportunity thing, you know? So so there, there's also there, there was like an overlap there that really kind of excited me, and this is one of the areas that I'm exploring there, is that um, so when I when I when I first started doing passive house, um, I could make the argument fairly easily to convince myself that I could have afford to put more embodied energy into a building project to increase its performance over code. Um, because the Virginia grid that I was building in was so dirty with coal that within a year or a year and a half, my embodied energy budget was back to zero. Like I'd zeroed, I'd saved what I spent. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, about three years ago, I did a, uh, a talk at the South Pacific Passive House Conference, and that was in the South Island of New Zealand. And on my way there, I did a calculation real quick, kind of a similar calculation. But the, the interesting thing in New Zealand was that the um, the power that's generated in New Zealand, the energy in New Zealand is in the South Island is generated primarily from uh, high, uh, hydrothermal and um, uh, 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 hydro, you know, uh, dams. And except for a little bit of uh, energy peak energy that they get back from a coal-fired path on, on the North Island in the winter peak loads. They're really not. Um, they're really not a very dirty grid at all. I think the entire the entire both islands is only like twenty percent fossil fuel at this point. So, so it's it's got a very green grid to begin with. And so when you do the um, the calculation of here's my code house and here's my passive house, what became very clear is there was no payback. You couldn't make the argument that you could put one extra bit of carbon into it because you would never get it out. Like like the the you know, you're not going to have the operational savings of carbon. So the only real savings might be some maintenance over time, but it's really, it's really a hard argument to make. So that, that combined with the fact that there was a monopoly has led me to the conclusion that the way to take New Zealand forward into this kind of next step is to set up a bunch of micro manufacturing around um, sustainable agricultural products that are processed into 
um, into uh, building materials that will compete with the with the monopolies and duopolies. And the good thing about that, in, in good and bad, is is you know kind of the same side of the coin, is that with these monopolies driving the prices so much high because they can get it, it means there's a lot of there's a lot of freeboard above the price. It's not a commodity. It's not a seven dollar sheet of OSB, right? So. So, you know, if you're paying 40 bucks for a piece of plywood that costs you and I 15, then, you know, there's some there's some some free board above there to do some micromanufacturing and try to get these costs where it's equal to or less than what they're paying now, but with a very low embodied energy. So things like um, hemp. Hemp is just starting up in New Zealand. They're bringing in their first 500 hectares of commercial hemp. Uh, the folks doing that are, are doing fiber. So for every one ton of fiber, they have seven tons of ship of, 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 of just waste basically and that's our building material so hmm. so um there's also a big industry in flax before um before uh synthetics uh new zealand was grew lots of flax and lots of hemp for fiber for, to, for rope and so there's a lot of and, and uh, new zealand ships out i mean if you go to almost any port in new zealand you'll see raw logs being shipped out and they shouldn't be, you know, they're just, it's a commodity economy. A lot of times they're just shipping stuff out. So, um, so, you know, this kind of extractive, uh, uh, economy based on, um, uh, basically plantation pine, radiata pine is, is just kind of, it's, it's, it's pretty unsustainable and pretty unhealthy for the environment. So, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential there and there's a lot of interest. So there's, you know, there, and so, so one of the things I'm doing is I'm trying to explore uh, ways of bringing new systems, new building systems into the market um, and, and to deal with uh, New Zealand's kind of protected uh, building products market. It, it, it's really kind of interesting the way that New Zealand works. It's like, it's such a small country that you can actually make change and affect change. You can actually get things done. You can actually meet with people. You can actually meet with government people ask, you know, like the person in charge, just go ask them, you know? Um, and so um, there's some, uh, you know, everybody's aware of what's going on uh, with the building, within building products and people want to switch it. There's some politics around that, of course, but um, I think that there may be a way in leveraging the combination of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship Fellows that are, that are working in New Zealand right now and um, the Maori connection to, uh, of a way to bring some of these products to market in a, in a more... Um, in a way that's not going to require them to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on litigation fighting fighting the big monopolies. Sure. So you know that that's been an interest of mine too. But that that's just getting started. I mean, like the the hemp folks. I mean, they're literally um, just brought in their first crop and are and are now just processing their first. You know, it's all just kind of fledgling, which is exciting to be like out there at the cutting edge. With them. Well, you're uh, one of the things that you're kind of famous for is um, saying. It, telling people and proving it by doing it that you can build passive house buildings at the same cost per square foot as market rate normal yep. houses. Is that made easier by the fact that building materials are so expensive in New Zealand? Is that like- No, a no, 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 no. It's the same problem everywhere. No, 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 not at all. It doesn't make it easier at all. And basically what you've got is the same problem everywhere. A bunch of untrained people who don't know what they're doing, who's afraid of the passive house stuff. And they just overcharge because, you know, not, that's not true everywhere. I mean, there are people who are bringing passive house in at a reasonable price in New Zealand, but um, more it's like, um, it's like everywhere. It's where it's, it's just really, it's just, an ex, it's expensive to build a house. If you're spending 3000 uh, New Zealand dollars per, per square meter uh, on a custom home. I, yeah. I could take your same 3000 square, $3,000 per square meter and build you a passive house but it's still too expensive for the average person, right? You, you know, it's just not going to work. You know, the, the price needs to be half of that to start getting into the realm where, hmm. where, it, where, where it can really be helpful. And the other thing in New Zealand that's been kind of cool uh, about being able to help them is they're just getting started doing low rise wood frame multifamily. That has not been a thing in New Zealand. In fact, the first real project is going up now. What are they? So a cinder block or? Uh, block, yeah, if they're doing apartment kind of stuff, it's, it's usually a block or a precast or cast in place or, um, yeah, but, but apartments have been hugely popular, right? It's just kind of starting, you know, just like we know that when, when, um, people with asthma live in passive houses, they do better, but that there's no real value there, right? You can't go out and, and get an extra money on a loan because you say, well, my, you know, my, my house is going to make me healthier, you know? So, 
you know, it's, it's really interesting because um, there is work that I've come across in New Zealand where they actually do uh, put a value on how much the health of a house uh, where they've actually done studies and said, you know, if you fix this person's house, it will have this much value over time. So where they're actually quantifying the health risks of some of these, like uh, in some of the houses that people are living in in New Zealand, just like in the U.S., I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty bleak. The yeah. poor folks that are living in just like wooden, basically wooden houses that are just moldy and nasty, single glazed glass, and no insulation, and holes in the walls, and uh, you know, it's 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 like you know, like anywhere, you know, people are um, are struggling. But but the cool thing about New Zealand, and this is way different than the states, um, is that they have a much more um, uh, vibrant social safety net. Um, you know, I mean, I was in a in a, in a town. I, I I used to live in Roanoke, Virginia, hundred thousand people. On any day, uh, we would have over three hundred homeless kids in our school system. Uh, there were over a, a thousand people uh, homeless in Roanoke on most days. Sometimes more, sometimes less. But I mean, that's the general vicinity. Uh, I was in a town. It was uh, fifty thousand people. If you put that to the United States. Roanoke, Virginia metric. It was a little rural town, just like my little rural town that should have, you know, 500 people homeless, right? They had two. And both of them had mental issues. And one guy had a house, just like living on the street. And they had consternation about the fact that they couldn't get everybody taken care of. So the, there's still there's still a sense of heart in New Zealand. And, I, you know, this really came home to me the day that the Christchurch shooting went up. And then, you know, watching what happened in the next, the weeks after the way that the communities came together, right, left, middle, up, down, poor, rich, you know, white, black, brown, you know, all the, came together to support these tiny Muslim communities. The way that Jacinda Ardern, you know, when she addressed these people, she said, you know, these are our most vulnerable people. A lot of these people are refugees that we bring in. They have the least, they need the most from us. They need gentle, loving kindness. And seeing the way that the average Kiwi embraced these people, it just broke me as an American. Like, you know, like I knew that this hate was coming directly from my country, directly because of, of my country, this hate is being spewed all over the world. And as an American, watching the Kiwis' hearts come together and grieve together and support each other in a way that I have yet to see ever in the United States, like, it just felt to me so clear how far down the body politic in the United States, the society in a whole has gone, how dark the heart of the United States has gotten compared with like these Kiwis. And, and within nine days, they said, you know what, we're getting rid of these guns. Uh, you know, because New Zealand was like, like it was just like Virginia. You can go down to the local gun store and buy yourself a gun. I mean, you can't just buy one like, right, you got to get a license, but it's a little harder, but it wasn't that hard. You, know, you can get a gun if you want a gun. And so um, watching that go on and watching the society pull together around it, watching the way they supported each other, it was just eye-opening to me. And now my entire focus has completely shifted um, to the answering a basic question, which is in a world, theoretical world, that has made the change to regenerative thinking and doing, what does the built environment look like? I really can't get my head around what the built environment might or might not look like in a regenerative world without having a much bigger picture of what does regenerative economics look like? What does regenerative social um, equity look like? What does regenerative resource leveling look like? You know, how does all this work in a, in a future society? And so um, the cool thing that, that I'm using kind of as a case study or as a way to look at this is that the native Maori folks in, in New Zealand have for years um, had a kind of natural uh, indigenous wisdom about the land being stewarded and not owned. And what, what really became clear as I got into the New Zealand psyche was that um, when I started thinking about regenerative the regenerative built environment, the first thing I run into is the buzzword regenerative because it's a buzzword, right? People use that without knowing what it means, I feel like. I actually, so, I mean, but I've heard it before. Is it the same as sustainable, the idea that it's just... You know, well, it's, it, 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 you just need to look into the all this regen... There's so much regenerative agriculture, regenerative economy, regenerative um, uh, circular systems, they call them. 
the um, when you start going into it, you know, there's just a lot out there. And so for me, I needed to come down to like, what's a basic definition that I could use personally to guide my research or my my studies. And for me, it came down to healing. Regeneration is healing. And, and it starts with healing of self, healing of the inner self. And, and then it starts working its way around to your family and your society, your local community and your, and your the environment, social equity, economic. I mean, they, it's just, but, but everything around it is centered in my mind on healing. And um, one of the greatest storms, sources of pain uh, in this world uh, is the inequities that happen because of um, colonizer and colonizer, right? So indigenous peoples and, and, and colonizers. And, you know, as a children of Britain, you know, uh, United States, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, we all share a similar kind of uh, background. It's like, you know, different for each, but are very much similar. And uh, in the United States, we have, of course, the, the additional pain of, of enslaved peoples to deal with. Um, but, well, but for good or bad, what I found was that in New Zealand, um, since the seventies, they've been working as a society on reconciliation in a real way. Now, good, bad, you'll hear all kinds of different reviews, but in general, what's happened after 40 years now, a generation and a half is that the idea of reconciliation coming together as a multicultural, multi-ethnic state that is going to be expressed, not just with the British Union Jack, but with all of the peoples that make up New Zealand, um, this kind of has worked its way in, in both up into the federal government where like the conservative government a few years ago actually gave uh, legal status to a mountain and a river and a big tract of land, a big, a big undeveloped uh, like a national forest. And the idea is that, it, and this is what I think is really cool, in order, one of the things that's clear to me is that in order to go forward in a regenerate state, you need to be dealing with healing, but you also gotta be comfortable with uncertainty because we've never been here yet or we haven't been here for many, many tens of thousands of years, so we don't really know what it's like. So you have to be comfortable with uncertainty. And one of the things I was most impressed with is that you take a conservative government in New Zealand, who a few years ago actually gave these rights to this land. And what they said was, we don't really know what this means. We, you know, our people say this is what we ought to do. We think this is a good thing because we respect our people in our society. But in essence, we really don't know exactly where this will go, but we're going to try it out. And so that really kind of hit me pretty intensely. Basically, what I'm doing is asking them, you know, hey, I'll help you do some high performance stuff if you'll let me look over your shoulder and see how you're learning. Right. And, and the, it's been really interesting. Some of the groups, they start out kind of like, let's do some some shredding with the local community. But pretty soon it jumps back to like an architect led builder driven, you know, architect builder driven kind of. A building scenario that's sustainable, but it's not really, it doesn't really truly incorporate as deep wisdom as some of the other groups are going. So it's, it's been interesting for me in that sense. And I'm just learning. I mean, I, this is a three year fellowship. I'm not even a year into it. So, you know, for me, it's, it's, a, it's, it's mostly a learning process. We're not going to make the change if we think we're going to bring everybody up to the level of Western uh, societies, so, right? We don't have enough earths for that, right? We just flat, no, we can't do that. It's unsustainable. There's going to need to be some type of voluntary simplicity movement with people in the West. The glimmers that I'm seeing in New Zealand are really super exciting. To deal with the climate emergency as a species, we are like totally able to do it with our brains. Like we are the smartest freaking animals out there. But the problem is that it's not our brains that are going to save us on this one. It's our hearts. I share your hope that uh, people mm -hmm. will have heart and <laughs> be vulnerable to making things better uh, and would not just mm -hmm. with the brain. So thank you very much for taking the time. Adam Cohen, Passive House for Everyone YouTube channel. Go watch those videos. Adam, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Corbett. And you guys, please do comment, like, subscribe. Tune in next time.